Yeah, hello everyone. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. So I'm presenting the second part of the computational social science tutorial. And I mainly want to talk about uh, measurements and explanations. So what do I mean by measurement? So a measurement is simply the assignment of a number to a characteristic of an object. So a very simple example would be you're interested in the length of an object and you use a linear or ruler, a ruler to figure out what's the length, right? Unfortunately, in uh, the social sciences, we are mostly interested uh, in invisible objects, in complex invisible objects. So for example, the culture of a country or the political leaning of a user, the happiness of a user, the motivation of a user. So these kind of things are difficult to measure, but still we kind of want to measure them. So what is the problem? So one problem is that the only thing which we can measure is the observable outcome of the phenomenon or um, the thing which we want to measure. And people use everyday language, which is weak. That's another problem. And many factors may impact the observable outcome. So it's, it's kind of tricky to measure these invisible complex uh, things. And therefore, uh, I want to argue that um, it's important to think about um, how can we ensure the quality of our measurements. So how can we make sure that we actually measure what we want to measure? Um, and there are two important concepts in this context. So the first one is reliability, and the second one is validity. So reliability is mainly concerned with how consistent and stable is our measurement. Um, so for example, there are different notions of reliability. So the first one is, for example, uh, intra-rater reliability, which simply means um, if you, you know, show the same tweet to the same person again, and you ask the person to assess the sentiment of the tweet, would you get twice the same answer, right? So do you get consistent uh, measurements? Um, Inter-rater reliability is basically concerned with um, how much uh, humans agree on the rating. So if you have a couple of people um, rating the happiness of one tweet, how much do they agree on it? Um, and test, retest reliability is concerned with what happens if you repeat um, the whole study, right? So if you use a new bunch of people, show them again the same data, would you get the same results? Um, the second notion of quality is validity. And validity is concerned with um, the question whether you actually measure what you want to measure. So the first uh, notion of validity is face validity. And face validity simply means, is your measurement plausible? So that's a very, you know, Simple, um, simple test, but it's a, a plausibility test. Does it make sense what you see? The second notion is construct validity, which basically relies on theories. So sometimes you have theoretical expectations of um, how the thing should look like which you measure. And construct validity is concerned with whether the measurement corresponds to what you would expect from theory. And the last notion is uh, criterion-based validity, uh, and here you are basically comparing your measurement with an external criterion. So let me give you one example to make that a bit more concrete. So in our own research, we were interested in uh, measuring uh, cultural relations between language communities. So we developed a couple of measures which we thought make sense in order to uh, kind of quantify the relationship between different language communities uh, in, in Europe. So the idea was to quantify cultural relations, like how similar are two cultures, how well do two cultural groups understand each other, and how much uh, affinity do they have towards each other. So you see what we are measuring is complex and invisible, so we need to worry about how can we assess uh, the quality of these measurements. Um, how did we do that? So first, um, we are using Wikipedia for this study, so we are basically looking at um, articles in Wikipedia about different cultural concepts, so for example, cuisine, music, uh, literature. And we look at these articles in different language editions. Um, and the question is simply, um, if you, for example, take this cuisine example, um, how similar is uh, the German cuisine to the uh, Italian cuisine by comparing the description on Wikipedia? The second question could be, how well do Germans understand Italians by comparing um, how well does the German Wikipedia edition, um, you know, how well, how, how well does the article about the Italian cuisine on the German Wikipedia edition uh, correspond to how the Italian described the Italian cuisine? So that's the, the measure for understanding. 
And then for affinity, we basically looked at a few counts. So we were interested in how much more interest uh, do the Italians show, for example, in the German cuisine than we would expect on average by looking at all other language um, editions. Um, so it's not really important how we are measuring these things, but the point I want to make is um, that we put some thoughts into uh, thinking about how can we assess uh, the quality of the measurements. So the first thing which we did was uh, to check the face validity. So as I said before, face validity simply means plausibility. So we basically used uh, the measures which we inferred from Wikipedia. So the, the inferred cultural um, similarity which we got from Wikipedia between language pairs. Um, and we ranked these pairs. And then we sampled from the top um, of the list and from the bottom of the list and showed this uh, combination of uh, pairs here uh, to mechanical um, Turkers, so to Turkers, right? So we used mechanical Turk uh, to ask people um, which of these two pairs uh, is more similar. So which of these two uh, country uh, pairs do you think are more similar in terms of their culture? Or concretely in that example in terms of their food culture because we, we did that for food. Um, and what we saw here is that indeed the measure is very plausible. So that's of course a very rough check, but uh, people uh, showed a very high agreement with you know, the ranking which we produced um, and um, what they perceived to be similar. Um, further, we also checked um, criterion-based uh, validity. So what did we do here? So here we used uh, the European um, Social uh, Survey, which is basically a survey where people uh, in different countries get questions about their values and beliefs. And also from these survey responses, you can infer similarity, cultural similarity, because if two countries, uh, if people in two countries share more values and beliefs, then maybe these countries are more culturally similar. So that's an external criterion, has nothing to do with our um, similarity, which we inferred from Wikipedia, but still we can simply uh, look into the ranked correlation to get an idea of um, how well uh, is the criterion-based validity of our measurement. Um, we also used different uh, subsamples uh, because um, we wanted to ensure the reliability in the sense of, you know, does it make a difference what kind of subsample of articles in Wikipedia we use or do we get consistent results? We could have also used repeated measurements. We didn't do that, but of course Wikipedia changes over time. So you can simply think about using different dumps over time and, you know, com um, conduct the same measurements and check whether you still get the same results, right? That would also be um, a way of um, getting insights into the reliability of uh, your measurements. Um, and finally, we also checked a construct-based validity because we had some theoretical expectations of um, how, um, how the cultural similarity between neighboring countries should look like. So there are some theories that basically say that um, you know, if you are close, so if, if you are neighboring countries, so if there is a, a if there is a, um, if they are close in, in terms of geography, then of course more interaction is happening. And interaction uh, enables similarity because uh, culture is learned. So that means if people interact, they will learn from each other, they will adapt the culture, and therefore um, proximity should be related with similarity and also with understanding but not necessarily with affinity. So affinity is a different story. Uh, and that's exactly what we have also seen for our results, that there is a high correlation between understanding, similarity, and proximity. So that's, that's the, the, the kind of the last check which we, we did. So um, in this part, I just wanted to motivate a bit um, that it often makes sense uh, in computational social science to think about how to um, assess the quality of measurements, though it's very tricky. Um, but usually, you know, even if you cannot go through all these reliability and validity measurements, uh, some of them um, usually, you know, can be, can be explored. Um, and then you can feel more confident about that what you are measuring um, is kind of stable and maybe makes sense to a certain extent. Um, so in the second part, uh, which is much longer, I want to more focus on explanation. So let's assume now, you know, we have already measured two things which we are interested in. Um, and we kind of believe that what we measured makes sense. Then often you want to explain which factors impact um, what you are interested in, right? So what makes people happy or what impacts cultural similarities? So you are interested in the relationship 
between two or more variables. Um, of course, the most simplistic thing we could think of uh, when we are interested in relationships is we could look at correlations, right? Um, but correlation measures are symmetric measures. So if x is correlated with y, y is correlated with x, and often you have spurious correlations, as in this example here, where the US spendings on science, space, and technology have a very high correlation with the suicides uh, by hanging, strangulation, and suffocation. So there are things that are highly correlated, though they have nothing to do with each other. Um, so what can we do to, to be, be a bit more sophisticated when we are interested in relationships? Uh, maybe it makes more sense to look into regressions. So for regression models, we um, at least already look at um, asymmetric relationships. So we, we are basically, in, in this example, looking at what is uh, the impact of um, going to an elite college on the future earnings of uh, students. So this is a very uh, simple example because we have a binary uh, variable here, a binary uh, independent variable. So either a student goes to an elite college, which is something which we define, or to a normal college, and we want to know what is uh, the impact on uh, the future earnings of students. So that's a typical social science question. You're interested in whether you know, certain um, educational, uh, um, educational uh, measurements or, or things kind of impact the future um, of students, uh, educational policies maybe. Um, so what we are really measuring is an average effect, right? So we basically can answer the question, um, uh, which is do people who went to an elite college earn on average more later in life? Um, the problem here uh, but is of course um, that we can have omitted variables. So for example, uh, being accepted in an elite college might correlate with many factors like um, abilities uh, or motivation. So what could we do? I mean, of course, we can control for these things. So we can just have a multiple regression system and we add the factor which we think is a confounding factor, in that case motivation, to our equation. So what is then happening? Well, basically we try to statistically control. Um, so in that example, can I actually draw something? Is that okay? Um, so in that example, it could be um, that here we have the earnings and here motivation. And we have these two types of students. Um, they either go to an elite college or not. But maybe we do not observe uh, students, uh, from normal, uh, students from elite colleges who have low motivation, right? So maybe we only have here you know, some, some individuals. So these are uh, normal and this would be elite. Here in the middle, there is a good mix of people. And here are maybe slightly more elite students. But like in, in this corner, we do not really have observations for um, people from elite colleges with low motivation. So what does the regression uh, model do? I mean, if we have a multiple regression model where we would fit two lines, um, where we, sorry, where we would um, you know, look at the two groups um, going to an elite college or not, we would have two um, lines, right? So the, the slope of the line would indicate um, the effect of motivation. So one unit increase of motivation leads uh, to a certain increase, which is defined by the slope in um, the outcome variable, the earnings, right? And that's the same for both groups, because I did not include interaction, right? So we are assuming that the effect of motivation on earnings is the same for um, normal students and elite students. Um, further, we are extrapolating um, this effect here because we are assuming if that is the line now that corresponds to elite students, um, then we are assuming that we know the effect um, of motivation for elite students with low motivation. So we have zero observations. So we are basically just extrapolating um, this thing, and we are kind of assuming that that is correct. So my point here is basically um, that we are looking at average effects. And um, if we are concerned with causality, we are interested in individual level effects. So we want to know what happens if one individual um, who went to an elite college would have chosen another college. What would have happened with this person? So it's uh, essentially an individual effect which you're interested in if you want to know what's the causal impact of choosing either this college or this college on my future. Um, 
So the, the major difference and the methods I want to talk about later is um, that you could think about finding twins, right? You could try to find people who are as similar as possible and basically compare the outcome for them rather than looking at the average uh, trend which you usually um, do with regression models. So if you um, look at these two equations here, you also basically see um, that uh, the, the only difference here is, uh, so B2 is the coefficient of motivation, right? So that tells you what's the slope of the line. Um, and then the difference between going to an elite college or not is basically captured by the intercept. So here the intercept is B0. And then um, for uh, the elite college case, it would be B0 plus B1. So you have, an, an ever, you have the average difference in the future earnings captured here in the intercept but the effect of motivation um, on the outcome is the same essentially because it's the slope of the line. So what I want to argue is um, that if we are interested in explanations, we are most of the time interested in um, causality. So you want to know if you change something, what would happen. And therefore you are often interested in individual level effects. And, um, the basic idea um, or the, the philosophical um, notion of um, causality goes back to uh, John Stuart Mill who basically said um, if a person eats a particular dish and dies in consequence, that is would not have died if he had not eaten of it, people would uh, be apt to say that eating the dish was the cause of the death. So that's kind of um, how you can think about causality. Um, this is also called the counterfactual model of causality or Rubin's uh, causal model. Um, and what it tells us is really that, it's, uh, that you want to check different alternatives for one individual and the difference um, what would have happened to the person in this world and in this world is considered uh, a, a causal effect. So here again, um, coming back to this example, what you would like to do is you would like to observe uh, the earnings uh, of a person and then there is a certain time where the treatment happens and then you want to know what happens to the student uh, afterwards in case you know, the student has chosen uh, the normal college or in case the student has chosen the elite college. So you're basically interested in the difference uh, in the outcome for the same individual in the treatment and in the control condition. So that's the individual uh, level causal effect. However, the fundamental problem of causal inference is that you never can observe uh, the same person in the treatment and in the control condition. So what people usually do is they look at average treatment effects. So you look at the expected value um, of people in the treatment condition minus the expected value of people in the control condition. Um, but how can we make sure that uh, the people in the treatment and in the control condition are not substantially different from each other? So do not um, differ in many other covariates. So the solution, um, which probably all of you know, is of course using experiments. So by having random assignment of people to treatment uh, and control groups, we make sure that we wash out all other differences um, that might have happened due to other covariates. Um, another criterion or another characteristic of, of experiments is that the manipulation of the treatment is under control of the researcher. That's also important because different levels of treatment should lead to le different levels of outcomes. That's another assumption of real experiments. Um, however, today we don't want to talk about experiments because uh, experiments also have limitations. So they are often expensive. Not all treatments are ethical or possible. Um, the internal validity of experiments is very high. So by internal validity, I mean that you can be very sure that the effect uh, that you observe is due to the manipulation, um, but the external validity is often limited, meaning that it's not often clear or not always clear whether you can actually generalize your findings to the larger world um, if you have done a small uh, lab experiment with a couple of students. Um, and there is also another assumption which is called the non-interference assumption which is often violated, especially uh, in social science field experiments. So in, in traditionally in experiments, you assume that the treatment uh, um, which you give to one individual has no effect on other individuals because you decide whom you want to treat. But in social science field experiments, you have a connected world. People are friends with each other. So some treatments might cause spillover effects. 
So it could be, but you know, I decide to treat you, but you are good friends with him, and therefore, you know, he's also a little bit treated. And that can happen. Um, so therefore, there are some limitations of experiments, especially in the context of social science, which, you know, makes it attractive to think about alternatives. Um, and the alternative, the first alternative I want to talk about um, are matching methods. So the idea um, of matching methods is basically that you try to find um, organic uh, data. So you, given the set of organic data, you try to find data that looks like they have been generated by an experiment. So you basically try to balance uh, covariates. So you try to find here in that example um, people who are as similar as possible given your covariate. So motivation is my covariate, this is my outcome variable, and I want to compare students from normal and elite colleges that are as similar as possible given this, this covariate. So for all these guys here, I cannot find anyone who is similar, right? So probably then I cannot say much about these people here in terms of uh, causal effects on earnings. So for, for low motivated students, I basically do not really know what is um, the causal effect of choosing either normal or elite college on, on earnings. But here I have a couple of um, people where I maybe can find similar, um, similar others. So we are basically looking for twins um, and matching means that we prune the data. That means we are basically removing those people for which we cannot find twins. Um, so here another example um, where we basically um, are interested in whether um, a special training helps uh, to get a job promotion. So this example is similar to the other one in the sense of that you have here um, education in years um, and uh, the, the C individuals are those who are in the control group and the T individuals are those in the treatment group. Um, and what happens here is uh, that you can clearly see um, that the, the select, that there's a selection bias. So people who were selected for the special training did not have low education or very high education. Those were the people in the middle who also got selected. Uh, some of them got selected for the special training. And now you want to know whether this uh, special training had a causal impact on the future career of the person in the firm. Um, so basically the, the position changed, the outcome. So if we would use a simple regression model, we would see so a, a linear regression model where the position is the um, outcome variable and we assume this is a linear combination of education and whether the person is treated or not. Then we would have uh, again this example with two lines, one for the treated uh, group and one for the control group. Um, and the difference here which we observe would be the estimated uh, treatment effect. However, if we change the model slightly, if we say, well, Maybe, you know, um, we take um, education to the power of two, so we use a quadratic regression model. Um, what happens then? Well, then, interestingly, the lines flip around, right? So before, we, we thought that um, people who, had, uh, who were exposed to the special treatment um, really have a higher position in the firm, so the, the red line was above the blue line, but then in the quadratic regression model, it looks different, right? So this is a, a classic example of um, model dependence, right? So if you slightly change your model, your results basically flip around. Um, matching methods help to avoid that because you balance covariates. So what would happen if we would first match? So if we use matching methods, which I will explain in a second, we would remove all these people for which we cannot find twins. So we would remove the people here in this corner and in this corner because there are no people who are treated who have a very low or very high education. And after removing these people, we can again simply fit the regression line to the remaining data. And then this regression line actually becomes very stable. So now we can slightly change the model and we still get the same result, namely that there is no significant difference between treated and control units. Um, so we lose the difference but we get a stable result. So with matching methods, um, you can either um, try to um, copy completely randomized experiments or fully blocked experiments. 
So completely randomized experiments means that you basically flip a coin for each patient or for each user, and then you decide whether this person is in the treatment or in the control group, right? Um, for a fully blocked experiment, um, you are basically trying to balance covariates more. So maybe you are very concerned with, um, or you're very interested in gender, and therefore you have a, a male group and a female group, and for each of those groups you do the random assignment to make sure that you have the same amount of uh, men and women in, in both conditions. So sometimes it makes sense uh, to, to have a fully blocked experiment, especially if you have very uneven uh, distributions. Um, so in both cases, you balance unknown covariates, but uh, with different mechanisms. Um, and there are two um, matching methods which I want to um, introduce. So the first one basically tries to um, mimic a completely randomized experiment, while the second one tries to mimic a fully blocked experiment. So in general, if you can, a fully blocked experiment is, of course, more powerful because you, you kind of make sure that the covariates you care about are balanced. So mehala novis distance matching is a method that approximates um, a fully blocked experiment. So what you are doing here is you try to find these twins. So you try to find for each uh, person in the control unit you try to find the closest person in the treatment um, condition. So the question is, um, I mean, there are many variants of how you can compute that. You can either match each individual with just one other individual, which would be one-to-one -one matching, or you could do one-to-many matching. So there are many variants which you could use. Um, and of course, uh, there are also many um, different distance measures which you could use. So Mehalanovis distance matching proposes to use uh, Mehalanovis distance uh, as a, a measure. So why not Euclidean distance? I mean, Mehalanovis distance is uh, a normalized version or a scaled version of uh, Euclidean distance. So Euclidean distance would have the problem that if you think about, I mean, we do this matching here in a high dimensional space, right? So just for simplicity, we always have now one covariate, and, uh, or in this case, we have two covariates, age and education and we try to find people who are similar in age and education. But we could have a high dimensional space. Um, and the problem if we just uh, would use Euclidean distance uh, would be that um, the, the, the measures, so the, the covariates are on different scales. So it, it's not really comparable, right? So we might look at yearly income, age, gender, body weight, whatever. Um, and then of course uh, the Euclidean distance would be dominated by um, the variable with the largest values, right? So the different scales would be problematic. So what we basically do if we use Mehalanovis distance matching is we scale our um, distance measure. So that um, this, this is just a con conceptual trick so that uh, all um, covariates are on a scale um, between zero and one. And afterwards, we basically can um, compute the distance uh, like we did for Euclidean distance. We could also use expert scaling, so it's, it's just a, it could also be like a person deciding, you know, how important are different covariates. So there are many things which, you know, you could tweak. Um, but I think the main message here is uh, that for Mehalanovis distance matching, you're really trying to find in this um, high dimensional space the points which are as similar as possible. Of course, one problem is uh, not only that you know, there are many variants because you need to decide whether you match one to one or one to many, uh, you know, how you maybe scale um, the variables, um, but also uh, a another problem is um, that uh, you need to pick a threshold, right? Because some, for some people, I mean, I could also you know, say, well, this person maybe is similar to this one. Um, but of course, uh, you need to define in your matching method somewhere a threshold where you say, well, if the distance is larger than k, uh, then I consider this uh, as a non-match, right? So I do not match everyone um, because you will always find pairs otherwise, right? And also, uh, this, this choice, making this choice uh, uh, can be critical. I mean, it impacts your result as, as least, right? Um, but of course, you can look at the distribution of distances and then, you know, make sure that you choose it in, in a plausible way. Um, 
but uh, my point is, I guess, uh, that researchers have lots of freedoms when, when using these methods, and therefore it's also in the same way as for um, regression methods recommended to te uh, test different variants, right? So because if you know how sensitive are your results um, to the threshold, which you can easily test, then at least you can be more uh, confident that um, your results do not flip around if you slightly tweak the threshold. So um, the second ma matching method, uh, which I want to talk about, is uh, propensity score matching. So here we are trying to um, mimic a, a fully randomized experiment. So here the idea is, uh, again, we have these two covariates, age and education, and we try to find uh, twins that are uh, similar age and uh, similar educational level. Um, but now uh, the idea is uh, that we basically compute uh, a logistic regression model, so we try to figure out what is the probability of being treated given X, and X are all covariates. In this example, just two of them, but could be N covariates, right? Um, and um, this probability of being treated is what is called the propensity score. Um, so you basically map all these uh, individuals to a scale from zero to one, which is their propensity score, and then you match people based on this score. So all people who have the same propensity score are now in one bucket, and you randomly create pairs. So, I mean, you can imagine what happens in the worst case. In the worst case, you match all of them to one propensity score, 0 0.5 or something like that. Uh, then, of course, uh, you prune randomly. So that would be the worst case scenario. Um, ideally is, of course, if you have a a nice distribution of different propensity scores, and then you can, can match people nicely. Um, but of course, um, you still can have an uh, imbalance in this case, right? So because if you um, see here um, for, for education, for high education, 28 years of education, we only have control um, units, right? And then um, maybe these, these control units um, with, oh, sorry, um, maybe like having a high education, uh, educational score leads to a low propensity score. So maybe people with low propensity scores are um, um, all with, with high education, and then of course there can still be imbalance though um, you are now looking at the propensity scores. And yeah, in the worst case is random pruning. So um, yeah, to summarize this, this matching, uh, or what I, what I try to you know, tell you about matching methods is I think matching methods are a, a powerful um, alternative to just using simple regression models. Um, of course, you can use them co in a combined way. So try to match first and then you know, check uh, whether the results of your regression model change. Um, but there are also several problems which are, I would say, open uh, methodological problems which maybe some of you find uh, exciting to work on. Um, so first of, all, uh, first of all, of course, researchers have lots of freedom. So it's, it's unclear like what is the best way of um, doing um, matching if you want to do matching. So you, you have to make many design choices um, and there are no real guidelines. It's more like, okay, try many different things and if you still you know, always see the same effects, then um, you can be kind of you know, confident that you don't have model dependence. Um, another like bigger issue is, um, of course, we remove people, right? So we throw away data. So for people for which we cannot find twins in this example, I throw the data points away. So my results, whatever I observe in the end, my causal effect holds for those people which I have not deleted, right? So I need also to be careful when interpreting my results. So that means maybe I even need to specify what is this group of people that I'm still looking at, at in the end for which I could balance my covariates because that might be a very specific group of people that is already very different from my initial sample of people. So then of course I cannot claim in the end that the causal effect I found now holds for whatever, let's say I looked at uh, uh, all students uh, in the US between a certain age range, right? Because maybe I removed a certain group already or for sure I removed a certain group already. So. That, that's, that's another thing that you know, we need to be careful then in describing what is the group of people we basically throw away. Um, another problem is that most matching methods have been developed for um, a low number of covariates. 
I mean, these methods uh, come from um, econometrics uh, and are heavily used in the social sciences, but there you usually, uh, your confounding uh, factors are limited, right? So you have maybe 10, 20, 30 uh, confounding factors. But what happens if, for example, text is the confounding factor? That often happens. Um, so for example, I recently heard a very interesting talk where someone uh, wanted to look into the causal effect of um, being censored as a Chinese blogger. So there are, you know, people write about certain topics and then um, some people get uh, censored and others not. Uh, your confounding factor in that example is text because you want to find twins who write exactly about the same things but one got censored, the other not. And then you want to see what happens to the people afterwards. Do they become more extreme or uh, less extreme? Or what, what is the causal effect of you know, experiencing censorship? So I found that very interesting. And it's, an, it's an, an interesting problem, not only because of the social science question behind, but also because you now have this high dimensional confounding factor. And these methods uh, I was talking about are not made for this, right? So now you could think of, okay, well, but then I use dimensionality reduction methods, uh, topic models, uh, or whatever, uh, pro um, yeah, you know these methods, uh, and that's, that's already, you know, enough, but turns out it's not really. So you also need to know, for the low dimensional factors, how important are they for the treatment? Because otherwise, uh, you know, you start matching people by random topics that have nothing to do with the, with the, with the treatment. So, there are a couple of um, open methodological problems um, which come from the fact that now we work with new types of data and these methods have been developed for data sets where you observe certain number of, of attributes but not like we do at the moment in the web where you have like millions of information about people, you have textual information and so on. So you have so much things you can match on that you know, we also need to start thinking of how can we advance these methods um, to make causal inference possible and plausible uh, in, in this um, web science community. Um, yeah, so I, I think the, the only uh, kind of uh, um, tip, um, you know, uh, one could give or uh, takeaway message could be um, that it makes really a lot of sense to compare uh, results from different matching methods. That's uh, at least what, what I started doing for my own research because that's the only way you can make sure that um, the results you observe by you know, making these different design choices are um, robust and do not depend on, on your choices. And you wanna make sure that you do not only avoid model dependence but also uh, me method dependence and therefore even trying different matching methods uh, makes sense. Um, so an, an, another um, alternative, so if we want to do causal inference, right, and we do not want to do experiments, are natural experiments. So how many of you know what natural experiments are? Yeah, okay. Um, so natural experiments are similar to experiments, but uh, the assignment is uh, only as if random. So you do not really randomly assign your subjects to treatment and control groups, but you try to find a setting where this assignment happened as if random. And the other difference is uh, that researchers do not control um, the intervention um, or treatment. So in a classic experiment, we said we would expect um, we can um, manipulate uh, the, the treatment. If we, for example, make the treatment stronger, we would expect that also um, the effect, um, the outcome which we measure becomes stronger. So there is this, this uh, possibility of you know, changing um, the intervention. In natural experiments, we can't do that. So let me give you an example. Um, so maybe we wanna know what's the impact um, of receiving um, a scholarship on the future performance of students. Um, we know that you know, there is a certain test and people um, who are um, above a certain threshold in the test will get the scholarship and people who are below um, the, the, the threshold will not get a scholarship. Um, now, of course, we have the problem if we compare these two groups, these two groups will be different in many, you know, in many attributes. They, they might have different abilities, learning motivations, socioeconomic backgrounds. So these are two different groups of people. So we cannot just compare um, 
their um, average future performance. That will not tell us anything about the causal effect. So what is the idea of, an, of a natural experiment is to use this uh, threshold here um, as a way to find an as if random assignment. So maybe it's plausible to assume that people who ended up slightly above the threshold just were lucky and those who ended up to be slightly below the threshold were unlucky. Um, if you know you believe that then you have a de facto called luck which differentiates now my two groups. And now maybe comparing the average of these two groups which are close to the threshold makes sense because the assignment seems to be as if random. Some people were slightly more lucky than the other ones but they are not totally different. They have similar scores. So this is called uh, a regression and discontinuity design because you are basically interested in the jump here between these two lines. So you can think about fitting two regression lines um, and the difference here, the jump in the threshold is what you consider um, to be the causal effect. So what you are basically doing if we again look at the simple linear regression equation is we have our outcome which is the future performance. Then again we have the intercept, um, so B0. Then we have B1 which is uh, the coefficient of the course and test score. So we course and test scores meaning we create certain bins of test scores, right? Um, and we have the uh, coefficient B2 which is uh, the coefficient of uh, a dummy variable which simply tells us whether someone received the scholarship or not. So it's either zero or one. Um, and we now want to estimate uh, B2, which is uh, the effect of receiving a scholarship for people with similar test scores. Because we statistically control um, all other variables in a multiple regression model, um, and therefore that means we control the course and test score. So we are comparing people with similar test scores and we want to know um, whether the future performance of these people um, who received the scholarship and those who did not is significantly different. So if you use a regression model like that where you, you, know, you are lucky enough and you found, you found this um, variable which you know, later we will call instrument um, that helps you to differentiate these two groups which have now been assigned uh, to a treatment as if random, then you need to do a couple of uh, robustness checks. So the first robustness check is basically you need to make sure that individuals cannot control whether they happen to be above or below the threshold. That's the most important thing actually because otherwise you have self-selection and it's not a natural experiment anymore. So if, if people have any way of, you know, choosing whether they are above or below, then it's not a natural experiment. The second thing which is recommended to do is uh, to check for jumps in placebo points. So what you basically do is you pick randomly a couple of points uh, in your um, re regression model. So we, we said before um, we observe here this jump. So we have here the line and here another one and we know here is our um, test score, right? Then what I would do is uh, randomly pick here from the x-axis, here are my course and test scores, they are maybe between 0 and 10, um, randomly pick a couple of points and always check, um, you know, is there a jump uh, if I would pick this point, right? I mean sometimes you see jumps at other points as well and therefore it's, it's good to see whether the jump in uh, the, the point which is the real threshold is for example much larger as the other jumps which you see by, by chance. Um, it's also good to check whether other variables jump in the threshold. So of course um, you, know, you look at the variable you are interested in whether there is a jump. So in that example um, it was, what was it? It was the outcome, so yeah the future, um, future earnings. Um, but it's also good to see whether other covariates jump. So if you have multiple variables you're interested in, sometimes this will also tell you that there is something else going on, if not only your outcome variable jumps in this point. Um, and of course you want to test uh, whether the results are robust uh, against using different bin widths, right? So you should have different um, uh, methods for coarsening uh, the x-axis, so the independent variable. 
so different ways of different granularity levels um, of, of coarsening uh, the independent variable. And uh, finally, of course, you want to distinguish between a discontinuity, which is the jump in the threshold, which we have seen, and nonlinearity. So if you look at this picture, you see that you, know, you can easily uh, confound these two things um, because, of course, if you have nonlinear relationship, as in the last picture here, it can also look like a jump. So it's recommended to kind of plot the outcome variable um, against the independent variable for which you expect to have the jump to see whether it's really a discontinuity in this point. Um, thresholds um, are not, you, you do not always find clear thresholds, right? So often uh, in, in nature you find fuzzy thresholds. So it could be that if individuals are um, above a certain threshold, then maybe they are much more likely to receive a scholarship. But not all of them do. So that would be an example of a, of a fuzzy uh, threshold. Um, in that, in that uh, example then, um, the test score becomes an instrument uh, for the causal relationship uh, between scholarship and performance. So you maybe have heard about instrument, uh, instrumental variables uh, before. Um, that's very related to regression discontinuity. It's just the difference is now that um, we really have this, um, so we have this fuzzy, fuzzy threshold. We have a higher probability um, that someone receives a scholarship um, if, it's, if the person is above the threshold. So let me give uh, the classic example for what's uh, an instrumental variable. So um, there is this study by Joshua Engrist, who is a professor um, at MIT, if I recall correctly, um, who uh, was interested in what is the effect um, of military service uh, on future um, lifetime earnings of um, people who join the military, right? So, of course, the most simplistic thing, you know, you would think of as a social scientist maybe is then to have this relationship between lifetime earnings as an outcome variable, uh, is a linear combination of, you know, an, an intercept, uh, a coefficient is going to the military service and a cer certain error term. Um, but of course, um, we know that there are confounding factors potentially, right? So what, what could impact, um, what could impact uh, the, what could be a confounding factor? Let me ask it that way. Any ideas? In insurers? Yeah, but would insurers uh, in fact, uh, impact the future lifetime earnings? Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah? Discipline. So there are certain disciplines where people like to go more to the military? Ah, discipline. Ah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that could be, yeah. Yeah. So what, what he suggested is that it's uh, the earning potentials, right? So if you have lower earning potentials in the first place, right, maybe because you have lower education or whatever, then you are much more likely to join the military because it gives you a safe job, right? Um, so there is this very prominent confounding factors. People who have lower earning potentials go to military and then of course that impacts the future lifetime earnings as well. So there is uh, this correlation here uh, between um, going to the military, so between the coefficient and uh, the error term, which is of course violating um, our linear regression assumptions. So and therefore we know that then uh, beta is biased and inconsistent. So it's not a good estimator anymore for um, estimating the average effect of you know, military service on uh, lifetime earnings. So we need to find something else. And what he did is actually very smart because um, he used uh, the fact uh, that during Vietnam War there was um, a lottery. So there was this lottery going on um, where um, they had uh, numbers um, and they were drawing numbers and basically if um, you are born, so if, uh, if the number is two and you are born on the 2nd of January, then you are selected. So people born on the day of the numbers which they um, you know, selected got an invitation um, to join the military. And of course not everyone um, who received uh, an invitation joined, but there was a very high correlation between receiving an invitation and joining. And of course there were a couple of people not uh, receiving an invitation, but they decided to join the military anyway. 
So you see, this is, this is a fussy relationship. It doesn't mean like everyone who receives uh, the relationship goes to the military and everyone who does not, does not go there, but there is a, a high um, correlation. And that's exactly what is uh, called an instrument. So the, the um, receiving this um, invitation from the lottery is highly correlated with you know, joining the military or not. But it doesn't have any impact on our outcome variable, on the future lifetime earnings. It's totally decoupled from that. And that's um, how you need to think about uh, an instrument. You want to find something that is highly correlated with your regressor of interest, but is not at all related with the outcome variable. So how did um, Angrist uh, use this uh, to estimate um, the effect uh, of the military service on the future lifetime earnings? So because uh, getting an invitation or not is binary, um, makes it very simple to compute um, this uh, expectation because you can simply look at the expected value of um, the, the earnings given someone received a lottery, so meaning L is 1, minus uh, the expected value of the earnings um, given someone did not receive the invitation, divided by um, the expected value of um, joining the military given that you received an invitation minus this expected value of uh, joining the military given that you did not receive an invitation. So that is called the Vault Estimator. That's exactly what they used. You can think about the plausibility check. Um, what is if, if, if the lottery is a perfect instrument, meaning that everyone who receives um, an invitation really goes, that would be the perfect instrument, and everyone who does not receive an invitation does not go, uh, then of course um, you simply, um, the result of the vault estimator would simply be the difference between the expected values in these two conditions, receiving invitation or not. Um, in this example, what they showed in this paper is um, that there was a 90% chance of joining the military and 10% joined without invitation, so basically the instrument explained 80% of the people joining, um, and the difference they observed was uh, $2,200 uh, per year. Um, so if you then correct uh, for the fraction that is explained by the instrument, which is 80%, you can estimate that um, the effect uh, of uh, joining the military um, is um, a, a decrease in um, yearly earnings of $2,750 per year. So that, that's what they um, found in this study. So I think that's a, a very nice uh, social science example of um, how one can find uh, an, an instrument. Um, but of course, ah, okay, sorry, first something. Uh, and what you could do if uh, the instrument is not binary, because what I showed you, um, the vault estimator only works for, for the binary case. Um, the more general case, which I just want to point out, is uh, to use a two-stage uh, least square regression. So how does that work? In the first stage, you basically um, use the regressor of interest as the outcome variable. So in that case, military, joining the military. And this is a linear combination of the instrument uh, and some error term. Um, then, after this first stage, you basically can check whether um, your instrument is good. Your instrument is good if um, it uh, is significant, right? So if there is a high correlation between the instrument, so receiving the invitation, and really joining the military. So that needs to be very related. Then you have a good instrument. Um, and if that's the case, you use the instrument here in this simple um, model to predict um, whether someone would go to the military. So M hat is the prediction from the instrument. Um, in the second stage then, you basically try to predict the outcome, or you model the outcome, the future lifetime earnings, as a linear combination of um, the predicted uh, value for joining the military service, which you had um, you know, predicted given your instrument. So therefore, you make sure that you only look into the fraction um, that is explained by your instrument. And you are assuming that your instrument is independent of the outcome. And that's the trick, basically. So you just use the part of um, the joining the military service that can be explained by the instrument. And you know the instrument is independent of the mm -hmm. outcome. So therefore, you are not mm -hmm. violating any conditions uh, of linear regression models anymore. 
Um, so these kind of methods, I mean, I was mainly talking about uh, classic social science examples. But of course, these methods can also be used uh, in this new uh, exciting area of uh, computational social science or web science, um, where you, you know, have new data sets and new problems. So an example which uh, came out uh, recently um, tried, uh, so it's a paper, um, I think published in PLOS ONE, um, which tries to uh, look into um, whether there is emotional uh, contagion going on in social media, right? So the question is, um, you know, a, a user exposes um, its um, happiness and does this affect the happiness of the friends? Um, if you think about this problem, most of you probably think about um, the Facebook experiment, right? Where they uh, try to manipulate uh, the emotions by running an experiment. Um, but what these researchers try here is uh, basically use observational data to figure out whether we find evidence for emotional uh, contagion in Facebook. Um, this is a very tricky problem because, of course, you have many confounding mm -hmm. factors. So it could be that uh, just happy users connect with each other. Um, so you have homophily, happy people are friends, but they are not, you know, they are not, there's no influence. They are just friends because they are similar. It could also be that there is a common exposure. So maybe I'm happy at the same day as my friends because this is the day where we always watch football together, whatever, right? There is a common event. We are exposed to this common event that makes us happy. No social contagion. Um, so the idea here um, of this study is uh, to use an instrument. And the instrument depict is weather. So the idea is that um, they are claiming that weather is a good instrument for uh, the mood of people. Um, maybe that's in Facebook the case. We will discuss that later. But the idea is that um, you know, if it's sunny, um, maybe that's maybe very correlated with you know, people being happy. And if it's rainy, then this is correlated with people exposing like negative feelings on social media. Um, if we believe that that's true, then um, the weather can be a good instrument for exploring um, emotional contagion in social media because we can control um, the city where people live and we can compare people who live in different cities um, but have friendships across cities, right? And then I can see, well, what happens if, you know, I'm here in Germany, it rains uh, all the time, and that's why I'm very sad and I'm posting negative things on Facebook, but my friends in San Francisco are not infected because uh, their life is sunny all the year. Um, so that's the basic idea. So you have no manipulation, but you exploit the fact that you came up with an idea for a, a good instrument. Um, so... The way they did that was uh, to, to first like, figure out you know, what's the emotion that is exposed in the content. They used Luke, which is a, a dictionary-based approach, which I also guess most of you have heard already about. So you're just <coughs> counting positive and negative words, and that helps you to get an idea of you know, how positive are users, right, or messages of users. Um, and they had a very simple way of thinking about emotions. They just looked into the fraction of posts with positive and negative words. So that, that was the idea. Uh, what you can see here is that there, you know, are, there are certain events which are emotional events. So that's just like a plot from their paper where they did this descriptive analysis, like Valentine's Day or um, Fourth of July, Thanksgiving. There are certain events where you see peaks in emotions, positive and negative emotions. Um, and the idea now is uh, that they basically want to create a model uh, a structural equation-based model to figure out what is the effect of the emotions of your friends um, on your emotional situation. So how are they doing that? Well, so the first term here is very simple. That's just a, a time um, fixed effect, right? So it could be um, that there are happy times. So that's the first part here in this equation. Um, then there is a fixed effect for users. So it could be that some users are just always happy, right, or always sad. Uh, and then the last part, or the, the part in the middle uh, with lambda, is the interesting part. So lambda is basically the, the, um, the coefficient we want to estimate. So that's the interesting thing. Because what it says basically is, so we sum over all friends 
um, of user j. So we are interested in uh, the emotional status of user j at time t. And we sum over all friends of user j, which you know, we do by summing over i. Um, and we look at the uh, strength of relationship between i and j, because maybe you know, closer friends uh, influence me more. Um, and then uh, y is uh, basically the happiness of user i at time t. So it's just a fraction of posts that user i posts at time t that are happy versus not happy, right? Um, and you basically divide uh, by the degree of a user j to make sure that you know, people who have many friends are penalized. So it's just a normalizing um, uh, factor, right? But so overall, what you are doing, if you estimate lambda, then you get an idea of uh, what is uh, the cumulative effect um, of a user um, on their friends, of the friends on the user, sorry. Um, so the, the trick here is, uh, I mean, the whole thing is computational uh, demanding, of course, because we have uh, many um, observations, so for each user and time, um, and we have to sum over all friends, so it's not a very simple model, but um, since we will do that for, uh, on a city level, it becomes much more feasible. Because what we have to do in order to make weather an instrument for this problem is that we need to break um, the relationship between my weather and the weather of my friends, right? Because of course it seems to be plausible that uh, many um, of my friends live in the same city and so again we have this problem of common exposure, we will just be exposed to the same weather. Um, so the idea here is uh, that they restricted um, the data during the analysis um, to days with rain or days without rain and they were comparing um, friends in different, with friends in different cities. So therefore they made sure um, that the impact um, of the emotions is, cannot be correlated, right? So there are the, the people are in different cities and uh, you break the correlation between the weather between uh, the two cities. So they found evidence for emotional contagion and if you're interested you can look it up in the paper but um, the question I want to more raise here is, um, I'm not 100% sure whether rain is really a good instrument. So of course, you know, you might see on social media that there is a relation between, um, you know, exposing positive or negative words when it's raining or not. But uh, of course, it also makes sense to critically reflect on whether, you know, we really think that there is a very strong correlation between um, being happy and um, the weather. Uh, it could also be that all we are measuring here with studies like that are conversational dynamics, right? Or, you know, someone complaining about the rain and then, you know, someone answering like, uh, and kind of, you know, showing compassion, for example, which might be perceived as negative. So I think, um, you know, when, when doing these this studies, uh, it's probably good also to think about uh, alternative explanations, which uh, could as well explain, you know, what they see that there is contagion, but maybe it's not really contagion, it's more conversational dynamics. So natural experiments, uh, to sum that up, um, are powerful and can be nice alternatives to uh, real experiments, um, but of course they are difficult to find. But I think after, you know, one has seen a couple of examples, um, you know, you can probably in an informed way watch out for certain things, right? For example, for cutoffs, for clear um, age-based thresholds, for certain um, criteria how people get selected, for location-based differences. Um, or, um, you know, you can try to find um, instruments which are highly correlated with um, the regressor you're interested in, but not really the outcome. So like things like uh, weather um, or other things. Um, yeah. So the last thing um, I want to point out is uh, a method which is called differences in differences. So that's related to natural experiments or matching methods, but I'm not really sure it's, it's none of them. So, but anyway, the, the idea here is um, that sometimes control and treatment groups um, are not randomly um, assigned 
but they start um, at different levels. Um, but there, the assumption is plausible um, that they move in parallel. So if you can make this lockstep assumption, um, then you can compare the outcome of the treatment and control group, um, though they start at different levels. So let me give you here an example, which is taken from uh, Wikipedia. So it's basically, um, you observe at time one, um, the outcome of a treatment and a control group, and they are different, right? But it's plausible in your setting to assume that these things should move in parallel. Then the difference here between S2 and Q um, is, the, the, the dif is, is the difference which you see, right? And the difference between SQ and P2 is the one which you would expect to see. And the differences in differences tells you something about um, the causal effect of the treatment. So that, that's, uh, that's exactly the treatment effect, yeah. Um, so I also want to give one example um, where this um, method has been used in uh, a social media study. So um, these people were basically interested in um, estimating uh, migration rates by looking at uh, geotagged um, tweets. So the question was, um, you know, can we observe the movement of people by looking at uh, geotech tweets of single user accounts, right? If someone tweets a lot, maybe you can observe that first uh, I was tweeting in Austria, but then I moved to Germany, and now I started tweeting from here. So obviously, I moved. So that's the idea. Can we observe that? Um, so what they uh, did here is they selected um, users uh, from certain countries. Uh, then they, they got a sample of their tweets. Um, and they, of course, had to prune the data for um, activity because only if you have very active users for which you have long histories of tweets, um, you might see, you know, when they move because if someone is just tweeting uh, not on a regular base or has a couple of tweets, you cannot see anything, right? Um, what they then did here uh, in uh, this uh, study is basically um, comparing the... Um, the mobility rates of Twitter users between different countries. Um, the problem here, to be honest, in this study is uh, that they compare it with the average rate. So basically the black line here is the average of all the other lines. That's not exactly the idea of um, uh, differences in differences. You probably would like to compare it with uh, some external criteria. But anyway, I mean, what they did, you can definitely do that. So you compare it with the average and you assume that these things kind of move in parallel, which is the second thing, which looks a bit questionable. Um, but then you can compare uh, differences in differences, which, which is what they did in this paper uh, by simply saying, um, you know, what is um, the out migration rate um, from a country C to all other countries at time point T? minus what is the out, uh, migration rate uh, on average for all um, OECD countries at time point T. And then they look at this difference minus the difference, the same difference at time point T minus one, right? And that tells you something about uh, the relative um, changes. Yeah, I think that's all from my side. I have um, some practical part which I can either show you, but I suggest that we first, um, that I first take questions and if there is still time, um, we can have a look at um, some practical examples. So do you have any, yes? Which one? This one? Yeah, so you are using science here, but it depends, like, I saw a positive uh, smile and the thought of second after me, my friend was, like, positive smile, but other friend of me was with two hours later. Now, how do you solve that? How do you use science? It's like, do you use local network science or traditional kind of thinking or what is more, more the science here? 
um, you th I think, so this is not my paper, right? I think he picked a certain time window, which was a day, if I recall correctly. So, but of course you have to, to pick uh, a certain time window which you're looking at. I mean, that's also a, a, a kind of design choice which you make. Um, probably what I would do is try different windows and see whether it significantly changes the results. So maybe you could start with, you know, experimenting a bit with, with different um, window sizes. But the, 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 the fixed time effect is basically accounting for um, that there are happy days, right? So it could be that on Christmas everyone is happy, right? So you want to account for this effect. But I think that's not what you mean. You more mean like no, how... No, no, the, but the, the aggregate... There is no difference. They aggregate everything into one user account. They, I think they do not differentiate between that at all. Yeah, but there is a trade-off of like sparsity and uh, you know making the time window very narrow. I mean, I agree. Of course, if something happens right after it, it's maybe the most precise way to do it. But don't you think that you then have sparsity problems? You mean here when you remove basically all those uh, for which you do not? Um, yeah, I mean there there is, uh, as I mentioned, I mean the trade-off here is definitely that uh, you know you remove those people for which you cannot find twins, so where you don't have balance in in the covariates. I mean in the worst case, uh, uh, which I mean in one study where, where I tried, so when I first tried to use matching, that was actually the case. If you have a high-dimensional confounding factor, you know you end up with throwing away. 85% of your data. And then, of course, I mean, it doesn't make any sense anymore to then use these uh, remaining 15% and then do a regression because obviously the data you are looking at is not anymore. I mean, in that example, I was looking at um, uh, freelancer platforms and I tried to match um, freelancers who are as similar as possible but um, are, are different in their um, uh, ethnicity or gender, mm -hmm. right? Um, but of course, if you then have to throw away almost all the data you collected from all these freelancer platforms, you cannot say anything about discrimination in freelancer platforms anymore, right? Because most of the data is gone. So there is, there is definitely this, this trade-off, but I think what I like about matching methods is at least it makes it transparent. Because when you just do the regression, you sometimes do not even notice uh, that you are extrapolating the line um, uh, though there are no observations at all for low motivated um, students from elite college, right? So you, you might not even observe that because you have enough data points. It's just uh, because you have here uh, normal students, right? And you fit your line by looking at uh, the difference, the sum of squared errors, right? And you do that for all your points. So you kind of find uh, a, a good fit, right? And, and the slope of the line is, is determined by individuals of both groups. So it's kind of okay, but then still, you know, I, I, I would not bet that you can make good recommendations uh, um, or good predictions for elite students with low motivation if you have uh, not a single observation for this group. Mm -hmm. Exactly, if you exclude that, but then you also exclude the part of the data, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm.
But I wonder how uh, you control that. I mean, so like through registration, for instance, like the minor, or just ensuring that I uh, report on all of them, or maybe that there's uh, maybe that do five of them make an aggregate score. Or, I mean, it's pretty clear, I think, right? I think mm. you said that you couldn't run ten different ways in order to pull some data from one or something. Um, but I just wonder what you. Yeah, I mean, probably reporting all of them yeah. is also not the best idea, but like, I mean, the first plausibility check would be whether you get consistent results, so at least like the same trend, right? Um, that's something which I would always put in a paper, right? Saying that, you know, we, we did these different variations of models and we always observed that there was at least a significant positive effect. Of course, then the coefficient varies, but at least people will trust you that there is this effect is present. It doesn't depend on your model choices. It's always positive, so that's kind of uh, the good thing. Um, then, I'm, I mean, I don't think you can kind of, you know, give an, uh, a confidence interval or kind of uh, bandwidth uh, of error just by doing, then it needs to be more systematic, I'm afraid. But uh, I think it was more like, a, you know, a, a practical suggestion for um, yourself of being more and more confident in that um, these results will still hold, though you vary some things, right? Um, I don't know what you want to hear exactly, but maybe you can elaborate on what you want to hear if you know that already. Yes. So I would like to say what you said is that the FDA data is the source of many findings out there that are confusing. All of the cases are there that how animal versus the genetic impact on your results. Mm -hmm. So you're asking whether there is yeah, a. Um, uh, Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, to be honest, I'm not really, I mean, I would not try to report something where I know it's very sensitive, but probably there are more systematic ways in how you would then report it, right? If you still want to kind of um, emphasize that there are certain variations which would then change uh, the, the results. But um, to be honest, I do not really know how to, to report that in the best way. Any other? Yeah, if not, I mean, I, I would suggest to end earlier unless everyone is uh, very unhappy about it. Then what do you think, Uli? <coughs> yeah.